There have been times in my relationship with the Lord where I have withdrawn and been apart from him. And really, those are times when I've been prayerless, where I'm not carrying on any conversation with the Lord. And it's so easy these days in our society to be waylaid by these um, things we invite into our homes. There's all kinds of things vying for our attention, uh, including uh, the television media and uh, social media and all kinds of things vie for our attention. We have these smartphones that bing and send us notifications and there's just all kinds of distractions that we invite into our lives. And a couple of years ago, I was in a particularly bad place in my relationship with the Lord because I got into habits, bad habits, that occupied my time and took me away from time where I could otherwise be engaging with the Lord in conversation. And uh, the real culprit or the real problem I had was with television. I got into some habits where first thing when I got up in the morning while I was drinking my coffee and chomping down my cereal, I would turn on one of these morning news programs, uh, either Good Morning America or the Today Show. It didn't matter but I was curious what was going on in the world and I would get wrapped up in that until I had to rush off to work. And then uh, when I had time for lunch, this was when Christy was teaching, so she wasn't home during lunchtime, but I would be able to come home and have lunch and I'd plant myself in front of the TV and watch whatever latest uh, television drama I was binging at the time, uh, usually on a DVD set or something like that. So there were two times consistently in the day I filled my time with television and really neglected the possibility that I could have spent time in prayer. Is it any wonder that I was feeling a little blue, sometimes even depressed, anxious? You know, when you saturate yourself in these things of the world, it is so easy to uh, feel badly, to feel depleted and weary, and uh, not have the strength you need, and certainly not the closeness in your relationship with the Lord that God invites us to. Now, my habits, even today, are a work in progress. There are times where I get waylaid and distracted, and I allow myself to fall into bad habits, but I think as I'm growing in maturity, I'm learning more and more to notice when that happens and then to recalibrate, to put more attention on things that really matter. So my situation's better now, but uh, I'm aware I could get off course so easily. And I would share with you that the job I had at the time when I was in the cycle of watching too much television, I was working at a church. I was going back and forth to a church office and it just goes to show that working in a church or for a church doesn't really make you a Christ follower because I wasn't making myself available to do the things that Jesus did. If you see behind me in the stained glass window, Jesus is praying, and we're going to talk more about that today, how Jesus prayed and how he serves as an example for us. You know, I was, as I worked for the church, I was pretty good at saying public prayers, you know, before meals or before Bible studies or even during a church service, but my personal prayers had dried up and I really had a um, desert type relationship with the Lord at that time. So what does it really mean to be a Christ follower? Well, if you're following Christ, let me suggest what you're doing is basically doing as Jesus did and living as Jesus lived. Does that sound radical to you? That a Jesus follower, a Christ follower, does as Jesus did and lives the way Jesus lived. And a faith walk goes way, way beyond just belief in Christ. Yes, we do need to believe in him and have a profession of faith to begin our walk with him. But a real relationship, any relationship, requires cooperation and a bit of work. And in the case of being a Christian, whether we like it or not, discipling 
uh, discipling others and discipling ourselves involves discipline and having certain disciplines in our lives. So one of the challenges for us on an ongoing basis is to self-discipline. You could kind of look at the Christian life and being in the church as having a gym membership where Jesus is your health coach and you are following Jesus's workout, workout regimen. How's that for an idea? Now, this morning when we have church together, I'm not gonna be playing the piano. I know that's a shock to you, but the reason I'm not gonna be playing the piano is because when I was a child, we had a piano in the house and I would pluck at the keys but uh, what I really wanted to be was a prodigy. I wanted to instantly be able to play music on the piano without doing the lessons and without practicing. So you see how that worked out for me. I didn't take lessons, I didn't practice, I wasn't a prodigy, so I am not playing the piano for the church this morning. Any skill that allows us to do something wonderful takes practice. The only way you're free to play the piano and to express yourself by playing the piano is if you've practiced. And the same goes for any practices within your walk of faith. We need to practice them. So Jesus followers, Christ followers, study what Jesus did, follow his example, and do the same. And that way we grow in our likeness to him. We also grow in our closeness with the Lord. Yes, we know Jesus was fully divine, Son of God, but we need to remind ourselves he also is fully human. And so the practices he did, he needed because he was fully human. And by doing these practices, he was more able to align his human life with that of the Father. And if Jesus needed these practices, how much more do we need them? If Jesus needed quiet prayer and times apart to focus and connect with the Father, how much more do we need that? If Jesus needed to fast for long periods of time to prepare for the temptations ahead of him, to prepare for the difficult ministry ahead of him, how much more do we need to fast in order to receive that strengthening and preparation? If Jesus needed solitude, times apart where he would get up in the middle of the night and go up on the mountain and have quiet time apart from the crowds, how much more do we need silence in order to hear what God has to say for us? and also to clear our minds from all these invaders of various people's thoughts and comments, all the commentators on news programs. How much more do we need solitude? Now, if we look in the book of Luke, in the gospel according to Luke, we see so many examples of Jesus praying. And let me just mention for you, when the gospels were written, they were written on papyrus scrolls, and there was only so many words you could get on a scroll. So it's not like today where we write on computers and you could write thousands of pages and never run out of room. On a piece of papyrus, you had to be very selective what you put there. So when we notice something repeated in a gospel or any books of the Bible, we need to notice that that's probably pretty important because why else would someone repeat over and over again the same idea when he was trying to squeeze so much into that one scroll so he could have one book on one scroll? So we see in Luke that Jesus, before he chose his 12 disciples, he went on the mountaintop and prayed all night. We also see in Luke a, a, a verse that says that often, Often he withdrew to the wilderness to pray. And before he asked his disciples to publicly state what his identity was, to identify him as the Messiah, 
Before that, he left the crowds, got apart with his disciples, and prayed. And before the transfiguration, he climbed a mountain with just his inner circle of disciples and asked them to pray with him. And while he was praying, he was transfigured. So do you notice that? That before major events and also before major tasks, Jesus prayed and he made this a regular habit. In our, in our scripture verse for today from Luke, we're reading about the baptism of Jesus. And this is in Luke chapter 3, verses 21 to 22. Hear this, the reading of the word of God. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. This is the reading of the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I just want to point out to you that in this telling of Jesus' baptism in Luke, there's a unique detail here that doesn't appear in any of the other Gospels, and that is that Jesus, after his baptism, prayed. And he prayed before the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, and he prayed before the voice came from heaven. It was like the prayer opened up the heavens, that the Holy Spirit came in the bodily form of a dove, and a voice was heard, even by the witnesses around Jesus, that said, This is my Son, whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. So we have an appearance here of the two other persons of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit and the Father. And they're showing their enthusiasm and favor for Jesus. But the stunning part about this is it's the beginning of Jesus' ministry, not the end. And what's stunning about that is Jesus has hardly done anything yet, and the Father is pouring out his love and approval on his Son. Jesus has yet to face the tough tasks that are ahead of him. The temptation in the desert with the devil. The religious leaders who are going to criticize him constantly and fiercely. And worst of all, facing the suffering and death on the cross. Now those things, those things at the end of his ministry, you can understand would warrant the merit of God's approval. But God's love always precedes any deeds. God's love precedes any deeds. What I mean by that is Jesus received the encouragement and endorsement of God, received his love, and was loved by him prior to any of his suffering and deeds. And the same goes for us. We cannot earn God's love. It's not merited by our deeds. God pours out his love on us first, and that empowers us to do those deeds. So notice, Jesus' prayer precedes Jesus receiving what he needs most of all here at the beginning of his ministry. He needs reassurance, love, and approval. Now, I believe Jesus was raised in a loving home with Mary and Joseph, that he received wonderful nurture in his at-home life. But um, he needed more in order to face what was ahead of him. And so when he prayed, he received that confidence that comes from knowing the love of God, hearing it with your ears, that, that voice of God saying, this is the one whom I love and whom I am greatly pleased. That gave Jesus fuel and encouragement for the next steps in his ministry. It gave him the strength he needed to overcome those temptations. Prayer unlocked what the Father desired already to give. So when Jesus prays, the Father hears. The Father listens and hears and responds by speaking. 
And sometimes we might wonder, why doesn't God speak more often to us? Why doesn't he always answer prayers verbally? Well, I'm going to suggest one possible answer, that is God knows what's best for us. He knows what we need at any particular stage in our life. And as we mature in the faith, we recognize that he responds to us in many, many different ways. Sometimes it is a direct word spoken directly to our mind and our hearts. Sometimes it's a word from a fellow pilgrim. Sometimes circumstances in our lives, they change or some God brings something into our lives. Sometimes it's an impression we receive when we're studying the Bible. But we get these nudges from God. And sometimes it's even a miracle. God reveals a miracle which is undeniable, and that is his response to our prayers. Uh, Dallas Willard, who wrote a book on hearing God, said that perhaps the reason God doesn't answer all prayers verbally is because he knows what we need, and he's just like any good parent, that he is looking to bring us maturity. He is, not, um, he, he is not wanting to make us dependent upon him. If he were to answer every prayer uh, with a, a direct word saying, do this or do that, that would make us dependent and it would make us weaker rather than preparing us to freely and obediently choose to live out a life aligned with God. So perhaps the reason Jesus got this direct word at his baptism is because this was the right time for Jesus to receive that extra boost in this early phase of his ministry. I know sometimes when we pray, it seems like it's a one-way street, that we're sending up our words to God, but they're not answered. But if we give up and we quit trying, uh, we're giving up on the practice that really clearly will empower us and undergird us. You know, we need to walk in following Jesus. Not give up following Jesus, but walk in following Jesus. So if I'm really authentically seeking a relationship and harmony with God, prayer is my main go-to, and it should be for all of us. What if... Each of us prayed with devotion and regularly, just like Jesus did. Do you think maybe we might improve in hearing and seeing and perceiving what God is doing with his replies and his responses? If there are gaps in our prayer life, if we don't pray that often or we have long periods of prayerlessness, we're, we're just simply not talking to the greatest friend we have. And we, of course, I would think, we would not expect much back and forth if we don't initiate the conversation or devote ourselves to it. So if we're prayerless, we're probably not going to enjoy our relationship with God. And we're not going to be energized the way Jesus was energized to serve and to be part of bringing light and life into the world. Now another scripture reading today is about the garden. And that's what the stained glass window portrays, is the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, if you're able to look real closely at this window, you would see that the disciples are sleeping in the background. And I'm sure you remember the story. Jesus, as was his habit, took the disciples to the garden to pray. And this is just before he's going to be taken into custody and tried and put on the cross. I hear this from Luke 22, verses 45 and 46. It says, When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. So here we have Jesus in the garden. He is demonstrating in his own practice that prayer is a habit that's necessary. If we look more in that chapter, in that prayer that Jesus prays while the disciples sleep, we know that he's in anguish, and God eventually sends an angel to strengthen him. But even the angel doesn't make everything okay instantaneously. 
But afterwards, when the crowd arrives and Jesus is taken into custody, he is calm, cool, and collected. He has total grace under pressure. He is no longer anxious. God has given him all the strength he needs to endure this crisis. Well, what would happen to us if we actually obeyed Jesus and prayed, stayed awake and prayed? What would have happened to Peter if he had actually stayed awake and prayed with the Lord? You know, Jesus had warned Peter that he was going to deny him three times. Peter didn't take that, that prediction very seriously. What he did instead is he slept when the Lord encouraged him to pray. And then what happened? He denied him three times. Is it possible that it could have been otherwise? That if, if Peter had stayed awake all night, maybe he would have received uh, comfort and uh, conviction that all would be well, even if things seem to be going haywire on the surface. So what I'm just saying is, I wonder, I wonder if sometimes we have difficulty facing crises in our lives because, like Peter, we don't pray. We don't pray, so we don't receive what God already wants to give us, which is confirmation of his love, assurance that he is with us, the strength that we need to overcome crises. So I just recommend to myself, I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching, preaching to you, that we make time to access the resources that God the Father wants to give. You know, some of us might dismiss this situation saying, Jesus is a special case. He's the Son of God, so of course he received answers to his prayers. But that is a lie. That is a deception. Jesus came instead to show us what human life in relation to the Father really looks like. He came in a human body in order to demonstrate to us that all these things that he is doing can be done, that not only would we do the things he was doing, but we would do even greater things than these. So we totally miss the point if we say, well, Jesus, of course Jesus got answers to his prayers. Well, I'm going to close here by just reminding us, if we pray earnestly, if we pray regularly, if we follow in Jesus' footsteps and make more and more time to pray, there is no doubt in my mind, and the scripture suggests this, that the Father will fill us with his love. He will reaffirm to us that we are his beloved children, and we will grow in faith and trust. Our love for God will grow, and we will know more and more that God is for us, God is with us, and God will never leave us or forsake us. We will have strength and confidence in the face of crisis because we have the love of God that we've received in our ongoing conversation with him. You know, what kind of friendship do we have if we never call a friend? What kind of friendship do we have if we never hang out with a friend? Not really much of a friendship. And so the Lord invites us into true and authentic relationship with him, true friendship with him. And thanks be to God, we have that spiritual tool of prayer in order to engage with him. Thanks be to God. Amen.